Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. And uh, I am very excited and pleased to uh, welcome two guests to this uh, presentation and conversation today. And uh, I'd like to turn to both uh, Raul and Carlo and have you introduce yourselves, and then we'll go ahead and do a brief presentation. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlo Piseno. I'm a core network planning director for America Mobile. I have been in the company for 15 years now, and uh, my main responsibilities are related to the adoption of new technologies for the network. I have uh, been leading the NFP and uh, SDM processes uh, recently for the group, and now uh, we are very focused on bringing a 5G and uh, all the cloud native uh, principles around it. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Fantastic. And uh, Raul? Hello, uh, my name is Raul Reyes. Uh, I am in charge of IT infrastructure and, and cloud services optimization. I have been in America Mobile for five years now. And my main focus uh, um, has been to enable and empower uh, the different and distributed teams in Latin America. So, so we can be uh, always evolving and always getting more of the innovation in the operation. Fantastic. And I, I want to thank you both. I mean, the partnership we've had with America Mobile has been nothing short of spectacular. We've been able to do some very exciting things. And over the years, it's culminated in uh, what we're about to talk about today. So I'm very excited to present this. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, let's see. Here. And there we go. And so uh, what I'd like to talk about today is the Enterprise Neurosystem Framework. And this is something we've all been talking about for quite some time. And uh, to set the stage, uh, I was in a conversation with Raul at a uh, beautiful restaurant in Mexico City called Loma Linda. And uh, he turned to me over lunch. And I, I've told the story before, so I, I'm sorry to repeat it. But uh, it was funny. He turned to me and he said, uh, what is Red Hat doing with uh, mobile networks and artificial intelligence? And uh, at the time I said, absolutely nothing because <laughs> it was still very early days. Uh, we were still kind of in that um, assessment mode to basically understand what the impact could be. And given the rigorous uptime requirements of mobile networks, uh, we were just kind of putting our feet in the water a little bit. And Raul really pushed us right into the water with that comment because I came back home, I reached out to a, a number of folks, including Chris Wright, our CTO and some other people. And we started a small focus group to take a look at what this could eventually become as a uh, community uh, directive. And so we've uh, been working on a long time together and I'm very excited to discuss it today. So here we go. Um, one of the core things we've thought about over the years is just that human and IT architectures share a, a number of strong similarities. And uh, we just noticed this more and more, especially with the advent of artificial intelligence, and which really is kind of the completion of this parallel model, you know, when you think about it. And you've got all these mobile devices, they could be considered almost nerve endings, they have the capability of you know, hearing and you know, sound and, and visual identification. And then data centers really equal the brain's functions in a lot of ways, like uh, the cerebellum and memory and you know, processing CPUs. And so what's interesting is there really is a kind of a parallel model, you know, we as a you know, species have created something that's very similar, you know, in, in many respects. And, and so in terms of the human body, the more core operations are fully autonomous, like the heartbeat, uh, chemical levels, the way we assimilate energy, and it still partitions conscious thought processes as part of that too. So it's really almost like two separate sets of uh, functions from that perspective. But the higher order or the the core decisions are made by the conscious mind, which is really kind of firewalled away and coexists with these other systems in, in a real sense of harmony, but also developed and honed by evolution over many, many years, to say the least. So we think corporations are kind of similar in many ways, and there are many different functions in a corporation, and it can span many different countries. And so we thought over time that it would be interesting to tie together all these different data points and all these different functions essentially as a single instance and to make it all part of a single framework. And that's where we have uh, ended up today, which is a new AI and machine learning telco community right now, which is called the Enterprise Neurosystem. And this is about AI infrastructure basically connected to every single business function across the enterprise. 
And we're definitely starting with telco from that perspective, but it will be applicable to all verticals because there are, you know, every corporation in the Fortune 500 is facing the same challenge. And founding partners include America Mobile, but also Verizon Media, Equinix, uh, Ericsson uh, Cove, Lambda Perceptor Labs, uh, Ernst & Young, Seagate, and uh, Watson's also involved. And really why it's needed is that AI models are being built and deployed in both kind of a do-it-yourself fashion and through different vendors, but without really a comprehensive integration framework or any kind of large-scale federation at the moment. There are lots of small kind of point solutions and AI models being scattered around the enterprise and uh, connected to data lakes, et cetera. But in terms of taking all those elements and all that information and cross correlating it for larger scale insight and, and deeper insight, uh, that's something that we saw the need for and why we're starting this community. So it basically unifies and optimizes an entire multinational corporation at that scale with a single AI and ML framework. And it enables, like I said before, the overarching cross-correlation of all these different data points. But then uh, what's interesting is over time, edge and core AI, all those instances become part of one system. And it just provides any form of management, whether it's you know mid-tier management or the, the C-suite, with a real-time view of all operations. And we've thought about a lot of creative uh, applications for that, like a hologram advisor or a robotic advisor, you know, like down the road. But of course, it would just be, you know, on screen for the time being, but we're looking to the future to do some really cool and uh, kind of fun, innovative stuff. And so conceptually, uh, you know, if you take a look, we've got all the core open source components like Linux and Ceph Storage and Kubernetes, et cetera. And then we have the Open Data Hub framework, which allows you to use open source uh, AI uh, platform tooling to create models and get them into production and maintain them. And then also that would then lead into the AI neurosystem. And so you would connect the neurosystem to IT, and then it would basically propagate from there and connect to all these different areas like uh, the finance area, network operations, uh, facilities management, legal and regulatory frameworks, human resources. I mean, go down the list, all these different areas would then be cross-connected uh, and integrated together to feed back all this data into the system. And, and here's kind of a low-level architecture example. And again, just an example you would have AI and ML instances in all these different areas of operation, in network operations, IT, and then the NOC itself. And what would then happen is quite literally, they would then be connected to yet another kind of smaller and more, uh, I guess you'd say streamlined group of AI and ML instances, and they could be GANs, they could be all sorts of different AI frameworks that would take the, uh, the lower level findings and begin to create a tree of logic basically, or a, tree of perception that would then take all that information, begin to filter it, and begin to draw out these kind of correlations that can lead to deeper insight. And so over time, you would have this same framework in every different business instance, and it would then go up into, let's say, a second or third or fourth tier of different GANs or different AI frameworks, into transformer frameworks or other AI frameworks, because we'll be using and borrowing from a lot of different areas to create this and ultimately into the recommendation engine that would then basically convey the results and the observations and the insights to management and the C-suite. And this would involve a uh, federated intelligence model. So you'd be taking all the different AI models, cross-correlating all their data, creating a, uh, a reporting intelligence that would basically then turn to management, as I said before, and, and relay all this information. And again, we would start with perhaps a dashboard on the left, just as an example, then on screen, maybe some form of uh, you know, human representation, and then eventually a hologram or some other form of intelligence that would convey this to, uh, to basically their, uh, their colleagues on the uh, human side. And so what's interesting about this too, is we have found, and actually MIT had discovered this as well, is that the combination of human and machine is actually three X more powerful than either one alone. So machines will have a certain error rate, humans will have a certain error rate, but together they actually reduce the error rate to almost less than a percentage. And so in many use cases that we've examined. And so really what we're seeing is this kind of merging of the uh, abilities of both sides of that coin into something that's actually greater and more powerful. And so in terms of work streams, uh, we're looking at different areas. We'll have a series of, <clears throat> excuse me, open models that we'll offer. 
Uh, we'll work on an open data platform and a middleware solution basically to cross connect all of this from an open source perspective. We'll be looking at, through the lens, looking at it through the lens of open AI op ops or AI operations. And this really could be considered kind of the marriage of business intelligence, the classic uh, way of uh, taking a look at different data around the enterprise and drawing meaning out of it, but also AI ops and the autonomous operation of the enterprise itself and how you can basically take all this together and understand it. And that would be under the umbrella of the Federated Intelligence section, which is uh, right there, number four. So the way we look at this is there are really larger implications uh, for global AI development. And this would be kind of where we've seen those tea leaves begin to gather you know, together in the middle. And uh, what we've noticed is that all these different elements do need to be brought together, integrated, and correlated. And so there's really a lot of benefit for the enterprise, and it's all the obvious things, but through a real, the widest possible frame of insight and being able to take in every single data point and understand what this all looks like. Uh, leads to cost savings, streamlined operations, and really it, it allows us to build a community sourced solution, which is based on real production experience from folks like Raul and Carlo and a tailored list of objectives that we can all adhere to. And then uh, the good news is a lot of existing open source offerings and frameworks can, frameworks can be applied today. Uh, there will be a few things that need to be created, but in essence, all the groundwork has already been laid by open source communities in terms of the tooling we can use. And ultimately, there are cross-vertical applications in financial services or oil and gas, and all these different industries can take this kind of a framework and apply it to their own operations. So it's actually a very exciting time for us. And, uh, you know, we're just getting it off the ground, and uh, we've already had meetings and have got things moving. So uh, I'd like to now turn, basically, to, uh, to Carlo and Raul. And... I'd like to ask you a few questions along these lines as well. I think um, what's interesting is the fact that America Mobile got involved in this so early on is really exciting. And the fact that you basically not only kickstarted us in this direction, but you're also uh, really embracing the open source, uh, I guess you could say methodology and way of doing things, we think is wonderful. So, um, you know, I think really, maybe you can talk a little bit about the value of collaborating in the open with your peers like Verizon Media, Equinix and others. I'd love to hear about like really what convinced you to do so and to move in that direction. Yes, um, okay. Uh, well, from a telco perspective, um, we started uh, some of the transformation projects in America Mobile some years ago, uh, adopting, I would say, a semi-open approach. But uh, I believe we reached a point in which we discovered that we were not uh, flexible enough. So now uh, I believe that uh, the open source world has uh, matured a lot. And we're convinced that uh, now with the industry trends around 5G becoming a reality, I believe that it's the right moment to show that adopting this logic and uh, Contributing back to the open source communities is the right uh, way to unlock innovation for future networks. Well, oh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Sorry for the, for the interruption. I, um, we, as Carlo mentioned, uh, we think that uh, the open source uh, projects are now the de facto uh, option no, in order to to solve big challenges. No? So today, uh, we see more and more and more challenges coming our way, and it will be impossible for us uh, as a single group uh, to tackle all these cons constant change at the pace as, as we are seeing today. No? So, so we are doing this because we think that the future of open source is promising. And from the community, the open source uh, shapes the technological evolution and the creation of an environment that uh, leads to constant innovation. We think that if we do not do this this way, it will be impossible for us uh, in the future. No, it's really exciting. And you guys have been wonderful partners in that regard. Um, and I, I think it's been wonderful to see the industry support. But what about, like, what about the technical value? I mean, what are the advantages of creating this kind of a multinational AI instance to manage and study your global operations in real time and to help you manage them. What do you find to be the value from that perspective? 
Um, uh, well, uh, usually I think operators like us uh, face very complex maintenance processes. So one of the goals we have is around the processes optimization with the ability to take uh, autonomous decisions considering a dynamic condition. So in general, adopting uh, an artificial intelligence and machine uh, learning logic uh, will give us the advantage to reduce operational costs and uh, at the same time, reduce the failures in the network uh, by having this uh, predictive logic. Uh, and uh, as we have uh, operations across most of the Latin American region, uh, we will also have uh, the advantage to learn how to apply this methodology in similar scenarios in all of our opcos uh, with this multinational instance and uh, common knowledge between all, uh, all of the countries. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So we believe we believe that uh, having uh, the technology that focuses on on predicting and managing the behavior of our operations will allow us uh, to forecast more effectively. No, and also hopefully uh, we we will plan uh, the work assigned in, in our NOCs. Uh, uh, hopefully before every uh, error or mistake uh, occurs, right? So, so before they happen. No? So machine learning will help us to learn faster as well. No? Uh, we think that this kind of technology will develop uh, better solutions as well, will help us to uh, leverage uh, and bring better, better solutions to our customers. So uh, we can maintain the stronger platforms in the times that not only uh, MVPs are needed because always the business is pushing to get more solutions as well but we need not only the mvps but also we need to have reliable and 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 to have reliability at speed at the same speed of the uh, of the business no totally agreed and i think that's one of the core values of doing something like this and you know i i think what you're really leading into is something we uh, that was mentioned earlier was just the, the combination of human and machine elements to basically create something um, more powerful from a cognition perspective. Do you do you feel the same way about that? Do you think it's going to be that kind of an outcome? I mean, in terms of your own opinions. It just uh, well, I think that uh, this is a process that uh, in general requires uh, maturity. So I expect that initially human knowledge and integration may be needed. Uh, but uh, the systems uh, learn to recognize situations and uh, correlate them with the solutions and data prepared by experts. So in the way that we feed the, these events into the solution, uh, the solution will know what to do and uh, avoid uh, risky situations for upcoming events. Uh, at the end, of course, uh, we expect that the solution would have uh, enough capabilities and intelligence to take uh, decisions on its own. And Raul, your thoughts? Well, um, on it's interesting how how uh, AI and and human. Uh, cognition are now collaborating in many ways, as you mentioned before. No, I think that in one side the humans train and explain the machine learning models, uh, and also they maintain new and create new models. No, uh, on the other hand, I think the the AI uh, brings more data and better insights. So uh, in a way, uh, AI boosts. Uh, our human potential. No, I think that uh, we can create opportunities uh, for engaging technology in a whole in a whole different way. No, no definitely so. And uh, to do something like this, do you see any advantages to do this kind of development in really an open source community manner, as opposed to more of a proprietary or in-house approach? Like, what would be the benefits as well, in your opinions? Um, yes. Uh, well, uh, 
As mentioned earlier, uh, we started uh, following uh, proprietary approaches uh, with some of these transformation activities within the telco environment. Uh, however, we have seen that uh, these proprietary solutions won't solve at all uh, what has been promised in the industry. So the first uh, thing that we expect is to have uh, technologies and uh, processes solving that, uh, that promise. Then we expect to have uh, cost reduction in, uh, in our processes. And uh, finally, we expect uh, or we believe that contributing back to the open source uh, communities give us the opportunity to enhance the solutions and uh, make them better all the time. Yeah, 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 totally. I, 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 we think that using a proprietary approach uh, will never give us uh, the openness and the flexibility we need in order to build the effective solution. So um, open source communities from our perspective uh, create more competition. And when there is more competition, uh, the price is reduced as well. No? So the massive acceptance of a successful open source project is very powerful. So, so we need to provide a neutral home for it. We need uh, to protect it. We need to, de to develop on top of it without uh, any, any other risk of, uh, of, of, uh, for, for this openness or flexibility that we are looking for. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, because this is a Red Hat event, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, uh, the fact that enterprise grade container platforms could be very useful in that regard. And how do you feel platforms like OpenShift and others can contribute effectively to this kind of environment? Um, well, I think that uh, OpenShift is uh, one of the most mature solutions to enable a cloud native environment. And uh, uh, we have very high expectations around it to provide all the flexibility necessary for uh, 5G and other uh, future network environments. Uh, also, OpenShift provides very good DevOps tools uh, with a smart uh, lifecycle management of containers uh, through Kubernetes orchestration which uh, give us the advantage to accelerate the development around the new trends, for instance, like uh, network slicing and enabling, for instance, uh, solutions at the edge of the network. So definitely uh, OpenShift is very valuable for, for us. For sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, today, uh, OpenShift allows us to, to take the containers and put them in the right place. Uh, they, it allows us to manage them, shut them, uh, shut them down if we see any problem. We are building today microservices and moving workloads from different clouds. No? But I think that uh, there is so much to be done, that uh, we have not harnessed the full potential of this type of environment. No? So, so container platforms uh, com uh, provide an easy and repeatable and portable environments and deployments uh, on a diverse, very diverse infrastructure. No? So, so I think that uh, we can contribute in a very important way so we can deploy a smart and more connected and automated platforms for, for the network and for some other environment. Wow, fantastic. Well, uh, thank you for the endorsement. I really appreciate that, but more than that, uh, thank you for your partnership and your leadership in this area with us. I mean, it's been really exciting to work with both of you and America Mobile on this initiative and with our partners. And, uh, wow, I'm just very grateful. And, and just want to thank you both for your time today. And uh, I think we'll leave it at that. But again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Thank you very much.